mind. But to measure them, the usual things like tangent or other derivatives did not work, and so Hölder introduced this exponent. It had been modified and uh, simplified, generalized in many ways. It is very powerful. And then Hausdorff introduced notion dimension, which he thought was just a matter of mathematical refinement for, for describing the very fine points of certain mathematical constructs. But turns out that one or the other of these, of these um, expressions very often is the proper way of measuring roughness, and they are linked to each other. And then there is something other which comes in. As you begin to, in a way, float freely and accept that nature is very complicated, that roughness is very subtle, that roughness reveals all kinds of complications, you find that it is necessary to introduce a concept which sounds like just science fiction, which is that of negative dimension. One replaces the notion of an empty set by a notion of latent set, which can have different dimensions. Of course, I have no time to say more, but it's a topic now of great interest. Now let me come to a topic which is very much at the order of the day at this meeting since Wendelin Werner received the Fields Medal. Uh, around 1980, when I was preparing the book that the president mentioned, The Fractal Geometry of Nature, uh, I had the very strong feeling that nobody had looked at Brownian motion for a very long time. Around 1900 or 1920, people did draw simple pieces of brown motion the best they could. And then, every so often, you saw a picture, but it's quite, quite clear that the pictures were there purely to decorate and not to understand. By then, I was a skilled observer of complicated shapes, and so I had my assistant draw a very big brown motion, and to make it uh, more beautiful, um, I had it end where it started. It is not, it is a, a loop. Why so? Because if you start brown motion here, and it goes, 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 and here, the different po points of the motion are different. It lacks homogeneity, therefore it lacks constancy. It's too complicated. And if you look for new things in a mess, you try not to look at everything at the same time. So I looked at that. Well, it was messy, all right, and not much clearer. But then it occurred to me, oh, the, that's how it is defined. Uh, it occurred to me that uh, one could perhaps simplify by erasing all these lines inside. So this shape here is one in which the plane is black, but all the trajectories which go from very far away until they hit this island, whiten it. So the black is the inside and the white is all the points accessible from infinity. When I saw this picture, instantly I remembered the islands which we have generated in our work on geomorphology. I've, I'm always very familiar with them. So familiar that I could give dimension very accurately. I would say this curve is dimension a little bit less than 1.5 or a little bit um, less than, a bit more than 1.7 because dimension is a true measurement of roughness, that true in a sense that conforms to our hand and our eye. If temperature, for example, had been completely unrelated to the ordinary feeling of hotness, it would not have been a good number. But temperature confirms what good cooks know about hotness. And here, the um, uh, fractal dimension confirms what a skilled eye knows. Looking at that, I had instant reaction, dimension is four thirds of the boundary. It was a conjecture. It was reported in my book, of, which has been mentioned. It triggered great mathematical activity. Uh, Bertrand, Bertrand Duplantier almost proved it, in a sense, he proved it completely, but by physical argument. And then Lawler, Schramm, and Werner proved it uh, uh, co correctly. And Werner has received this medal. He's the youngest in the group. This had been a very difficult problem. First, the people thought it was just, a, well, something for a weekend, for tomorrow, for a weekend, for a week, a month, a year. 
essentially, finally, it took 18 years. The computer rendering can be creative. That is, if you modify an object and if you make your mind and your hand and all together, uh, it increases their power enormously. Well, let me continue and um, uh, mention this book. Uh, the very fact that so, ma so many young people came towards me shortly after this book came out was totally astonishing because nobody expected anything new from this fractal geometry. But in fact, they have come in large numbers. In the bottom, you see a simulation of relief. It's completely fake. Uh, on top, you see this uh, Brownian uh, snowflake, uh, Brown Island. But um, the interest uh, that young people manifest for it is very, very strong. As I mentioned, I don't think it's because of my charismatic personality in the least is because humanity has been trained in a world of great roughness, great complication, and is more comfortable with complication than it is with simplicity. Mathematics, uh, um, uh, mathematics uh, is different in that it seeks simplicity, and the notion that something is simple mathematically that should be easy for the child, it was an old belief, but it does not seem to be true. Well, other shapes in physics do the same. Um, there is an interesting quote by Cantor, uh, Georg Cantor, the creator of set theory, which says that mathematics, the art of asking questions, is more fruitful than the art of solving them. Well, I hope there is some truth to that, because in my case, I did not prove much that was difficult, but I certainly asked many questions of my friends. This is a very simple shape which is completely ununderstood. After enormous efforts, it's more or less stuck. And then we get to uh, this uh, marvelous shape, which it was my good fortune to, uh, to look at very carefully and make, assumption, make uh, observations about. These observations uh, include many which have been proven well, one in six months, one in five years, one in 10 years, but the main one is still open. That is, there are two ways of defining this object. I thought they're identical, uh, but knowing my limitations as a, a technician, I did not spend more than 20 minutes trying to prove it. And this has been going now for 26 years, and two people came close to proving it, again, Yokoz and McMullen, but they're still open. It was modified to be, to be called Mandelbrot set is locally connected. Well, that's what Herbert says about this set. I would like to show you a few of the pictures on which I discovered uh, the properties of this set. So these are images uh, which came out uh, to make them reproducible on this slide. I had to take my original pictures and Xerox them repeatedly because it was not the bright, colorful pictures that you all know, but it was slightly dark gray on rather light and dirty gray on a machine called Versatech, which no longer exists. And the question was precisely to see what was dirt and what was reality. Uh, I was helped by a rather ridiculous um, incident. Uh, let me come back to this thing. The first picture of the set that we did I was in such a hurry to have it for reasons I could explain, but they're irrelevant, that um, I did not tell the, my programmer to do only the top part. Of course, by looking at definition and so on, it is symmetric. But uh, so he did the whole thing, and it was mess of the worst kind. Points all over the place, and little back blotches. But then there were two separate islands exactly symmetric on top and bottom. And mess, noise, machine imperfections do not create symmetric blotches. So I realized that these things were real and interesting and worth looking at and obtained this picture here to the right. Well, these are other pictures, again, um, in which we in evaluated that. And then here are some pictures which are before. The difference was that when I did these pictures here, I was at IBM. Uh, I was, have been at IBM for a long time by then, and I had a very good assistant, ve uh, very good machinery, 
and we could make nice pictures. The previous, the, the previous picture I showed you were done at Harvard under very hostile conditions because the system was very, very imperfect. Now, this was too complicated. I was looking at these pictures, and we did many pictures like that. Now I understand exactly what they are. But when I saw them first in 79, there was too much there. And in a certain sense, what I was doing, or trying to do, was complete madness. Imagine the following uh, stupidity. You want to study organic chemistry, or chemistry in general. But instead of starting with simple molecule, simplest molecule, which is the, the, um, the hydrogen or water or something, you, you, you start with, well, not a very complicated one, not DNA, but uh, ethyl alcohol or, uh, or something of the sort. It's too complicated. You get to there after you learned about water, for example. And so this, uh, these pictures, I, am, uh, I was trying too much and didn't see anything. Incidentally, um, the, there's something called La Teste Chaos, which ex fr older Frenchmen know about. Uh, my uncle was very enamored of it, so I learned from my uncle uh, uh, at a young age. And, um, and I had, uh, you see his picture in 79 on top, this little thing, that was a Mandelbrot set, but I did not know it. The environment was too complicated. It's by simplifying that I saw the, the, the interesting observations. Well, let me proceed. Well, this is having fun. Uh, everybody knows by now that you can have fun. Let me get to the final uh, topic I would like to discuss, and it's a matter of the variation of uh, financial prices. It is not a recent interest of mine. In fact, it's a very old interest of mine. I have uh, my fir the first time that I did the work which uh, uh, created a big sensation in a field was in the early 60s when I analyzed uh, financial prices of various kinds. But I returned to it and uh, in the early 60s uh, I was simply uh, fighting uh, excessive odds. At that time, um, the community of economists and finance theorists had suddenly remembered or realized that in 1900, a very interesting character in Paris named Louis Bachelier had written a PhD dissertation called Theory of Speculation. And in that dissertation, he introduced a process which turned out to be identical to Brown Motion and coming before, and he postulated that prices follow Brown Motion. Now, if prices followed Brown motion, the world would be very, very simple. You could say that if prices followed Brown motion, the extraordinary cost of establishing prices would have been very much simplified. But prices do not follow Brown motion. And so here's an example which shows this fact very strongly. And I would like to tell you a little bit about uh, my way and the way of some people of navigating between pure, very pure mathematics and very, very much hands in on the task. To the right, the lower lines, uh, the five lines uh, from top, from bottom, they represent either actual prices or uh, imaginary prices, simulations of prices according to a model which uh, I introduced. Now, most people can't tell the difference because uh, both the real prices 